today's interview, Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he was on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. Now, now uh, Professor Hankey, vocal critic of the Fed, as I am, but I think from different directions. Uh, he thinks they're doing a bad job of taming inflation because they're not dealing with the money supply. The money. He'll explain it. I don't. Let's 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 bring it. I don't. Uh, you're on today. Uh, you are the inflation whisperer. Inflation, obviously, is is probably the foremost economic issue facing the country right now. Uh, you are the Indiana Jones of bringing down hyperinflation. They call you in countries that are experiencing it. But your philosophy is that inflation is more a function of monetary supply. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate, John. Okay. I and and I, actually, that's the real place to start. The okay. question is, what causes inflation? Yes, everyone's very upset about inflation in the United States uh, now. The headline inflation, the, the consumer price index, is eight point two percent. Yes. The, the core inflation last month, if you take away energy and food prices, is go going up and it's at 6.6%. Shelter, which is a big part of the consumer price index, is up from 6.2% to 6.6%. Uh -huh. and, and what they call core services, that takes the, the energy and food out of there, core services up big time. 6.1 and and it moved up to 6.7 percent last month the core goods inflation is down just a little bit so we're kind of switching now we had a, most of the inflation started showing up with goods commodities that you you mm -hmm. would buy and and now it's morphing kind of over and switching into services like uh you know hospitality uh <laughs> Your haircut, all, all of those things are services. Uh, is, is that a typical arc for inflation to take, that it starts out in commodities like oil and gas and energy sectors and then yeah. switches over to services? Yes. And, and it was very pronounced this time because the money supply started growing in when COVID hit in February of 2020. And what happened? We were all locked down. So you couldn't you couldn't buy a lot of services. <laughs> the stores were all closed right so, but 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 at any rate that that is a typical pattern it starts with the commodities and after you get an increase in the money supply you you have commodity prices and asset prices start going up with a lag of about one to nine months john right and and what happened this time the money supply starts going up in february of 2020 of course, the stock market started booming. The oil prices went up. Mm -hmm. uh, soybean prices, corn prices, all the grains went up. Livestock prices went up. Housing went up right away, started zooming. And then we have another lag. And, and all of a sudden, the real economic activity kicks in. That takes about six to 18 months after the sustained increase in the money supply. And then ultimately, we're talking about inflation today. That comes with a lag of about twelve to twenty-four months. It's it's very long. The lag. So so any change in money supply or any change in interest rates is is really not going to be felt for another year or two. That's correct. And and right. this is what throws people off. Uh -huh. Things don't happen instantly. <laughs> they look at what's going on with the money supply today, uh -huh. and there's a lag between that and changes in asset prices, changes in real economic activity, and ultimately changes in inflation. So, so that's the transmission mechanism, and that, that's a tricky thing because of these lags that, that we're speaking about now. You mentioned hyperinflation, and, yes. and this gets this also gets back to the cause of things. I the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank uh, has done a couple of studies. Uh, they're they're a little bit dated, but mm -hmm. very revealing. They looked at 110 countries, John, and tried to see if there was a relationship between changes in the money supply and changes in inflation. Mm -hmm. And from 1960 to 1990, 
the, the relationship is one to one. If you increase the money supply one, you get a one increase in the consumer price index, 110 countries. Now, I just completed, in anticipation of, of speaking to you, John, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to update this. So we have a bigger data set. I, I just got the results this morning, actually. All right. This is breaking news, John. What? I don't even have a graphic <laughs> yeah, for that, yeah, sir. I'm, I got well, nothing. I'm glad you're- I'm you're, not prepared. I'm glad you're seated. All we right. have 157 countries that we looked at from 1990 to 2021. Mm -hmm. And again, that relationship is almost perfect one-to-one. -one. Increase money supply by 10%, you, you increase inflation by 10%. Decrease the money supply if that mm -hmm. should happen, and you decrease in a one-to-one -one relationship. So the Fed has been increasing money supply, I don't know, since 1960 maybe, but wasn't the after the 2008 financial crisis and they you know they went into that QE period where they were just increasing uh, money supply they were keeping uh, interest rates down at zero haven't they been pumping money into this economy for for many years and yet inflation has only reared its head uh, right after this pandemic period so I'm wondering is it not necessarily just money supply is it also, you know, the war in Ukraine and, and wheat prices, is it OPEC deciding to restrict production? You know, corporations have kind of been suckling at the, the teat of, you know, easy money for a very long time without this real increase in, in inflation. There's been, uh, it, it, it seems as though it's, it's when the money went directly to people who needed it, that this, well, that this has, has reared its head what what do you make of that that's probably a lot to unpack you it is but you put your finger on three key things yes you you, you said you said inflation is global no inflation is not global it's homegrown it's always local created by changes in the money supply in a particular central bank for example we have the federal reserve the united states Mm -hmm. That 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 is the 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 epicenter of what's happening with changes in the money supply created by the Fed and okay. the commercial banking system in the United States. The UK, the the Bank of England determines that. The Euro, the eurozone, the European Central Bank does that. Now let me give you the examples, uh -huh. and and these are important. Okay. Right now, right now we have inflation. In the United States, 8.2%. It's a little yes. higher in both uh, the Eurozone and, and the United Kingdom. It's 9.9% um, it's in, in Great Britain right now. Okay. Look at this. Japan, what's the inflation rate? It's 3%. It's not global. It's not global. And, and that's because of the Bank of Japan's controlling the money supply. They haven't exploded the thing like they have in the United States Great right. Britain and the and Europe, Switzerland, inflation is now three point five percent per year. They've mm -hmm. controlled the Swiss National Bank controls the thing. Of course, the the winner out of the whole thing is China. China is following the quantity theory of money. They know the changes in the money supply affect inflation. Their inflation in China is two point five percent. Right, but don't they manipulate their currency as well? They well, control uh, their own currency and, and manipulate that to their well, to their they, benefit. They, no, they try to, <laughs> and and they right. are different. They are different than the United States in the sense that they have exchange control. So mm -hmm. that that is that is a big impediment. They don't have a freely floating exchange rate because they have exchange controls. And one reason, by the way. That mm -hmm. the Chinese the Chinese yuan is is really not an international currency like the U.S. dollar is because they have exchange controls. So, yes, but but in in the context of inflation, John, it's kind of irrelevant. What what you said is true, mm -hmm. but but it's kind of irrelevant. So, now, why, so why would it be on. irrelevant if 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 it's, if it's money supply? Is it that? Let me let me ask you a question. Is it 
that if quantitative easing is going to higher income, right? Generally, that money won't be spent as quickly because there's large reserves and they're already consuming a lot. But if you give money to middle income, lower income directly, they're going to spend it right away and there's going to be a flood of uh, demand. Is, is that why the stimulus spending was more inflationary than when we're pumping a lot of money into the more corporate arena or the higher incomes? No, the, the reason that the stimulus in yep. the United States was inflationary is because we had increased government spending. That's a stimulus. And the revenues to finance that weren't sufficient. So we had a bigger government deficit. And who financed the deficit? Uh, over 90% of that was monetized. The, the bonds that were sold by the Treasury to mm -hmm. finance the deficit were sold to the central bank, the Fed. And when the Fed creates credit to pay for those bonds, that increases the money supply. That's, that's why the money supply exploded in the United States. That was one reason. The other reason, and most people don't realize this, mm -hmm. most of the money created in the United States is created by the commercial banks, co the commercial banking system. So at the time of COVID, commercial banks were pumping out a lot of credit the money they they were contributing to the increase in the money supply but right. then then the fed jumped in they piled in by monetizing the deficit the government spending and and that really goosed the thing tremendously now now that gets back to your key point you raised earlier about 2008 mm -hmm. remember you said well what happened in 2008 you said yes. we had this quantitative easing one, we had quantitative easing two, we had quantitative easing three even. Yes. And everybody said, oh, we're, we're you know, the sky is going to fall in, we're going to have hyperinflation. Some people did. That that didn't happen. And, and 2008, you, if you understand 2008, you're going to understand the whole ball game. Okay. 2008, we had, we had Lehman go under. Right. And we, we had a finance, we had a financial crisis. And the, the smart folks in Washington, I almost said the smart Alex in Washington, decided that Close enough. We would, we, the bankers were bad guys. The banks caused all of this. Yes. And we had something called the Dodd-Frank legislation that was passed. Yes. And, and that was to squeeze the banks and regulate the banks more because they were the bad guys. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time- You seem was, to not believe that they were the bad guys in this. Well, I, I don't have any view about it. I'm, I'm just trying to explain what happened. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, we're doing what I'm call, calling positive economics, not normative <laughs> economics. <laughs> okay, I'm down with that. I'm down with that. At, at, at any rate, by, by the way, just as a footnote, uh, Le Lehman was, was not bankrupt, by the way. One of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, Lawrence Ball, wrote a great book on this. It's clear that they shouldn't, they, they, the, the government shouldn't have let Lehman go under. It was, it was solvent at the time. But that, that's, and, and, and letting it go, by the way, just created a bigger crisis. That, that's another story, another day. We'll, we'll All right. take up that topic. All right. But let's, let's, get, let's get back to the inflation thing. Mm -hmm. So what happened? When, when, when Washington started squeezing the commercial banks, the commercial banks, which at the time were producing about 90% of the money in the United States, most people don't realize money is produced privately. It's not really produced by the Fed. The Fed the, in 2008 It's not minted was only, by the Treasury. It's not minted by the Treasury. Uh, mm -hmm. Some is, some is. But but not not the bulk in normal times. So mm -hmm. in 2008, the commercial banks were contributing about 90 percent to the money supply as we went into 2008. Then they got squeezed and they started going negative. They started withdrawing credit lines and so forth. And the contribution of the commercial banks went mm -hmm. negative. It went south. 
So what Ben Bernanke and the Fed did, uh, Bernanke was the chairman of the Fed at the time, mm -hmm. they did quantitative easing one to try to offset and mitigate the damage that was being done by Dodd-Frank and all the overregulation that was taking place. And, and then they did quantitative easing two and quantitative easing three. The net result of that was that the money supply, the money supply never grew very fast. It was only growing at about four and a half to five and a half percent. Right. So but if we it's had, a one to had, one on growth, why didn't we have five and a half percent inflation? Well, that's it. No, that gets into my monetary bathtub. And 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 the reason, the reason <laughs> I don't want to get into your monetary bathtub. I don't know who's been in there. Yeah, well, I, uh, it, it's there's right now there's a lot of excess money in there. Maybe you would want to get in it. No, but but what happens? It, think of a bathtub. And, and, and that, this is a metaphor, and, yep, and, and it's so. a pretty and it's a pretty pretty good one. So, all right. So the the money goes through the the faucet into the tub, and the tub essentially has two drains. One drains the money out to accommodate real economic activity, the growth in the economy, mm -hmm. and that that's usually normally around two percent of that increase in the money supply coming in goes out that drain. Another 2% goes out because as the economy improves, people demand more money. And, and that increased demand for money is accommodated by another drain of about 2% out. Now, if your inflation tar target is 2%, which ours is, mm -hmm. that's an overflow that goes out of the tub into inflation. Now, do you, do you get the you're picture? Saying that, you're saying happening? the velocity of the water then, how fast the water is coming out of the spigot is what changes the amount of inflation because the drains can only do 2% each at each yeah, drain. Right. So if right. you overflow it, uh, you're going to have an excess. It's going to it's gonna flood. I'm just staying with the back. I'm you're, a you're, shower you're, man myself, you're, but you're, I'm still going with you. You 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 got it exactly. That's that's exactly you, you 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 know a a wow. a plus. Wow. So so wow. here's what here's what happened. Here's what mm -hmm. happened. Go back to two thousand and eight. Remember, I said four and a half or five percent. Yes. Now, do you understand why we had low inflation and they never could get the inflation up to two percent target? But sector to sector, then you would expect that the inflationary pressures on each sector would be similar, no? But we see a wide variance in terms of what sectors. Yeah, this is this is another important point because okay. if, if you look at the consumer price index, you, you have a basket and, and the basket has roughly about 300 items in it. Okay. And 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 those those change what they call relative price changes, John. The, mm -hmm. the prices are moving up and down in the basket, up and down in the basket. And, and, and maybe if they're moving up some and some are moving down, maybe the basket doesn't even move. Maybe mm -hmm. The overall thing maybe doesn't move. Now what's happened, of course, is that the, we have relative price changes. Early on, I said we had commodity prices going up much faster than service prices. Now right. service prices are taking over. But, but the thing is, out of those 300 items, they're all going up. So that the, uh, the overall aggregate basket level is going up. And that's why we have inflation. The basic idea so is the idea, though, then that so we've had some catastrophic events. So you have a, a war in Ukraine that changes, you know, the, the wheat supply. You have supply chain issues from the pandemic, which slow down everything. You've got OPEC uh, deciding to restrict production in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of, of oil and gas, and then you've got record breaking profits. And so it seems like a very complicated mix that money supply itself or interest rates itself wouldn't necessarily address all it, th those seem like very blunt tools for something that appears to be more complex. Okay, now this this is a lesson in what I call signal and noise. You you've just emitted a lot of noise. That's my. Can I tell you something? Go ahead. That's that's my signature move. Okay. A lot of noise is the name of my biography. Okay. Well, well I, I'm a signal man, 
Okay. So, so let's 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 cut the noise and get to the signal. And the signal yes. is the money supply change is what's causing this. Let, let me give an example because you mentioned oil earlier and yes. now you just mentioned it again. Let's go back to the Arab oil embargo of 1973. I think given the color of your hair, you're probably old enough to even remember that. Oh, baby, I was there. I was in the, the you know, uh, Monday, Tuesday went the, the even license plate, odd license plate, all the embargoes. Oh, I, I don't oh, remember. Oh, oh, oh yeah. You, 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 you participated in Jerry Ford's win campaign. Whip sure. Inflate. I wanted to whip inflation now. Didn't we yeah. all? Yeah, okay. of course I did. I had the button and everything. Okay, that, that's another point, by the way. <laughs> These wage and price controls never work, and win was a big flop. We, we can talk about that later, but let's, let's go back to the, the Arab oil embargo of 73, mm -hmm. and, and we will then go to the second oil crisis in 79, and we will, uh, let me take you all the way to Japan. This, All right, because this is this is what they call a natural experiment. The first embargo in '73, the price, the relative price of oil went way up, and the Bank of Japan decided, well, we we better accommodate that so people aren't aren't so stuck with the thing, and they increased the money supply to so so called accommodation of the oil price increase, so it wouldn't be as right. damaging. They got inflation because the money supply went up, not, not because the oil price, the relative price of oil went up compared to everything else. Let me go to 79 in Japan. The Bank of Japan learned their lesson. Prices of oil went up relative to everything else, but the Bank of Japan held steady with the money supply growth and, and they didn't get much inflation out of the thing. Right. So, so that's, that's the lesson in these, Relative price changes create a lot of noise in the system. They're moving all over the place. And, and if you cherry pick one of those things and you say, oh, the price of wheat, you know, has, has gone way up because of the, the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and that's causing inflation. No, that's not causing inflation. The money supply going up causes inflation because if the money supply hadn't gone up and the price of wheat had gone up, You'd be spending money on wheat, but not on something else. And the price of the something else would be going down, actually. So you're saying that if 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 the central supply of money doesn't come in to ease. So I, I'm trying to figure out a way to mitigate discomfort, because what we're seeing is what we what we're being told is because inflation is now higher, we have to create pain that the only way to stop this is to slow our economy so that there is less demand. So people are gonna lose jobs. We're about to face economic pain. And yet we're also seeing record corporate profit. So I'm trying to figure out how is there a way to take in all the complexity, still think about the central monetary policy, but not make regular people feel the pain of a period of, I, I think we can all agree that zero uh, interest rates for all those years and quantitative easing did very well by Wall Street and corporate America. And now that uh, direct stimulus money came in, well, then we're all going to have to face some pain now. I guess my point is, isn't there a more complex way of attacking this problem without causing widespread poverty. No, no. <laughs> Wait, that's it? Just no? Yeah, yeah. That's well, not right. That, that, John, that's that's the short answer. May I explain? No, I'm just, <laughs> yes, explain. That's terrible. Uh, okay. That's okay. the worst we, answer I've heard yet today. Okay, well, I thought your conclusion was the worst one I'd heard today. Really? All right, come on. Get, tell, tell me why. Your conclusion was this. I, I think we might be more on the same page than you think. You, okay. let, you had a laundry list of pain problems created by inflation, okay? Mm -hmm. And this gets to the signal and noise thing. You said, this seems very complex. So you need some complex solution. No, you need a simple solution. And the simple solution is the quantity theory of money. And the 
Fed is not following the quantity theory of money. That that would be it's it's m the money supply times v its velocity equals p the price level times y real sure. economic that's, that's my license plate that that's I your, have that, that that's my that's on my car that that, that was on milton, milton friedman no, had that on his cad yeah. out, uh, out in california mv yes. equals py that's a quantity theory of money that says the following that if you want to hit the fed's inflation target at two percent you should be growing the money supply around five percent something like that right what what so what did they do what did the fed do the Fed has increased the money supply cumulative since February of 2020 by 41%. Now that's roughly that's roughly an annual rate of around 15%. That mm -hmm. is a rate that's three times higher than a rate consistent with hitting the Fed's inflation target at 2%. Now who gets screwed by that? But the Fed is also trying to keep employment up and we were in a pandemic we were in a crisis i guess the point is why is it when we're in a crisis for corporate america they can get a fire hose of money but when people are in a crisis they can't well this this is the whole deal with the quantity theory of money the, uh -huh. the fed was flying blind they don't look at the money supply chairman powell has said repeatedly that the money supply doesn't affect economic activity and has no reliable relationship between changes in the money supply and inflation. Utter, utter nonsense. Uh, in fact, he said on September 8th, I'm going to quote here, monetary yeah. aggregates don't play an important role in our formulation of monetary policy. And we don't think they are generally a good way to think about policy on inflation. Well, this mm -hmm. is just absolute rubbish. And, and we've been told... Now, now, let me let me go back because we we got a lot of topics here. I don't want to get too noisy myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so they 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 increase the money supply. Yeah, and and they're not because they're not looking at it. Powell admits they're not paying any attention to it. They mm -hmm. just goose the money supply. Now, why did they goose the money supply? They goose the money supply to finance the federal deficit. That that's how the deficit was financed. And they they grew the money supply about three times faster than it should. Now, who who wins and who loses? Who loses? The little guy gets screwed in inflation. And the little guy is the guy who's spending all of his money. If you right. spend 100% of your money that you're earning, you, you have a problem because you're facing inflation. Every time you're spending a dollar you're earning, you're facing but inflation. What the formulation rich guy, can occur here where the the little guy doesn't get screwed so the little guy gets screwed in inflation the little guy gets screwed in the remedy for inflation the little guy gets screwed during the pandemic so the little guy always gets screwed in any economic formulation i mean milton friedman god bless but supply side economics has created a tremendous amount of inequality has it not no 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 but the, it, no come it has on. not uh, come no. on hanky uh, let's go that that's another no let, let me let me give you the formulation where the little guy does not get screwed all right, all right. come with that and 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 that is following the quantity theory of money and, and Milton Friedman. Now, in 2020, actually, President Biden said, mm -hmm. fortunately, Milton Friedman isn't running the show anymore. Well, that, that was that was a bad deal for the little guy because the little guy would not have been facing inflation like this if the Fed would be paying attention to the money supply and growing at, at about 5% per annum. We would well, have Milton some Friedman was running the show inequality did increase dramatically. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, is, is that a controversial statement? That, well, yes, that is a controversial statement. You can't have it both ways. You, you, just, you just said he's not, when he's not running the show, meaning recently, yeah, the, uh, that inequality has increased. Then you, then you go back. No, no, to, no, no, no. I'm saying that inequality <laughs> increased during the Reagan era. I thought that the direct stimulation actually finally provided the little guy some relief. I actually thought that the stimulus checks and the earned basic tax income credit, all those things actually provided the little guy 
some safety and relief. So I, I would say the opposite, that when we didn't do I, that, the little guy always suffered. And now we're going back to making the little guy suffer again. I think John, John, you've been reading, you've been reading the advertisements and not paying attention to the facts. But <laughs> I, so, am I failing the class now? I was getting like an A plus earlier. You've dropped down a little bit. Oh you're, my God. You're, you're still. I'm you're not going to graduate. <laughs> you're still hanging in there. No, you're you're, <laughs> you're still passable. But all right. <laughs> but at, at any rate, let, let, let's go back to the Fed now. So the Fed produces all this money. They create all this inflation, and a partner in that has been the Congress. By the way, remember when this all started? It, Trump was the president. Mm -hmm. Biden wasn't the president. Trump was. So so it started in 2020, February of 2020. You know what? I think I might have blacked those years out. I don't I don't remember now, well, but you, and, I think and, the and, name sounds familiar, <laughs> but I may have blacked it out. So and, I don't I don't and, quite remember. And, it. And, uh, OK, and at any rate, I, I'm just reminding you a little history never hurt anyone. Yes. Uh, but so, isn't so you're saying supply so, and demand has no real issue on inflation. It has a big issue on relative price changes there. Relative price changes. Noise. Relative pri relative price changes are not in aggregate overall inflation, and mm -hmm. and so what did the Fed and and what has the White House said? They said inflation is caused by supply chain glitches, and it's mm -hmm. going to be temporary. Well, that we we all know that was ridiculous, uh, even though it's still in the press all the time. They still talk about supply chain problems. Then we then COVID that was a problem. You've mentioned monopoly pricing and gouging. That's a problem. Well, that that isn't that isn't a problem. And so none and, of those things are a problem. Those are all. Uh, 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 I, the, the, let's talk about the price gouging. That that agitates you. Obviously, you had to buy a car or something, and, and you know. Well, no, but I think you. you know when people are suffering, and you see you know at gas prices, and then Exxon posts profits. Like it, it does get to a certain. Uh, feeling that, uh, you know, depending on the variances of these pricings, that they never seem to suffer, that if they go down, like the airline industry goes down, we bail them out with a lot of money. And when we're facing inflationary pressures, they just make record profits. That does seem unfair. Now, you may say that's noise, but well, uh, to the uh, layman, uh, okay. that uh, seems very unfair. Okay, so oil, oil prices are determined to international markets. Unfortunately, the, the United States is- but It's is, a cartel. There, there is an OPEC cartel, true, but there are also a, a lot of uh, potential entrants. Something, are, are the shale producers part of the cartel? And are the shale producers maxing out and, and being encouraged to produce oil in the United States? No, they're not. The, the current administration has tried to shut that down. So the current administration has done a lot of things to try to restrict supply. The current administration is basically are operating like a cartel itself. They're trying to restrict supply. They, they don't want any, no, no carbon. But isn't fuels. that based on the idea that it wasn't uh, profitable for them to keep their refineries you know they over these past 20 years i guess they've they've shut down a lot of our refining capacity as we've moved on i mean i'm just i'm just suggesting that uh perhaps the solution isn't always through the fed that maybe there are solutions through well you're talking you're talking about other issues other yes. problems let's 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 stick with the topic that we started the program with inflation inflation is always and everywhere caused by one thing too much money period that that's the end of the story it, it, it's right. it is simpler than you think you're you're trying but to i have read i have read studies that have said that in 50 cases of monetary supply uh increasing five percent inflation was not increasing five percent over five years like the and and listen, you're you you know you're 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 the expert, and I don't. I, I've read studies that that contradict that, but the, I don't the, know. The, 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 whatever you're reading is rubbish. There, okay. there is never. I, I've looked. Oh, you know what? It is from Rubbish Magazine. That was my. That was yeah, my well, mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Let me ask you this: What school of thought would push back on you? I'll get to that in a second. Let me make a All statement. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, there has never been a, a sustained inflation any place in the world that hasn't been caused by by a preceding sustained increase in the money supply. Never. Now, mm -hmm. let me define. Let me define that. A sustained inflation would be over four percent per year. That's about half of what we have now. I'm defining right. that as a sustained inflation, and it would have to last two years. So I've looked at the record and and the facts. Right. And in all countries, if you have a four percent or greater inflation for over two years, there are always that has been preceded by sustained increases in the money supply. Always. So, so who who is pushing back on me? Yeah, I already gave one, Chairman Powell. The Fed, the Fed has canceled this, canceled it, and the reason why is mm -hmm. they don't want the noose around their neck as being the culprits that created the mess we're in with inflation right now that everyone's so mad about. That's why that's why they're trying to convince you, John, that. The supply chains did it, that Putin did it, oil prices did it, wheat, wheat prices, embargoes, you, you, you name it. So you're saying none of, none of those factors would have created a sustained, if, if it was just those factors, it would have been a transitory inflationary period, but it would not have been the factors. So how would you have handled the pandemic, like when people were out of work? and they needed money to sustain, how would you have handled it so that it didn't increase the money supply in the same way? Okay, Num number one, we had the government mandate that we couldn't work. So, well, so the but, but, but it was mandated, so let's not go back and relitigate what they no, did. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna relitigate it, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna litigate it now. I'm not gonna relitigate it, I'm, I'm litigating it But now. it's in the past, it's uh, the uh, past, uh, it Okay, happened. okay, right. uh, but... So what, what happens if the government tells me and they tell John Stewart that we can't work, Hanky and Stewart can't work, mm -hmm. they, don't they owe us something? Yes. So, sure. uh, so they, should be, they should be paying us because they've, they've outlawed work. Yes. So, so the question is, how do you finance that liability that the government is, is uh, in, imposed on itself? Right. And 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 the way to do that without inflation, the only way the government spends money, they have a deficit, and the treasury sells bonds to the general public, not the Fed. And if that happens, there's no money supply increase. You keep the money supply growing at about 5%. So by the fact that they were buying their own money supply meant that it was just a magic trick is that that that's sort of what you're saying is that yeah, yeah it, unless it, it, they're selling off the excess supply that they're making it's 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 then going to put that inflationary pressure but if they had sold those bonds elsewhere we if they'd sold the, if they'd sold the bonds to the public if they mm -hmm. sold the bonds to you to, to hanky and stewart hanky and stewart We'd have bonds. We'd have an asset. We sound like we a terrible vaudeville team, Hanky and Stewart. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we'd probably be a pretty good dog and pony show, actually. Yeah, we probably would be a pretty good dog and pony show. So if if that was the case, mm -hmm. Hanky and Stewart wouldn't have as much money. We probably wouldn't be spending as much money. We'd have bonds. We'd have assets. Our assets would have remained the same, but but our cash position would be diminished relative to where we would normally want it to be. And in those cases, what would we do? We tend to hunker down and get that cash balance increased. And if we hunker down, we're not, we're not spending as much money and, and we're not causing inflation because of course right. we don't have the money, we have the bond instead. So the reason that uh, the Fed is so adamant and pushing back against the quantity theory of money is that if you, look at the quantity theory of money and money is a cause of inflation and mm -hmm. the fed is causing inflation they're the bad guys they don't want to be fingered as the bad guys that's what the big lie is all about mm. and, and well and, so so here's the thing at least we agree the fed is wrong i think you and i both agree that the fed 
is is taking the wrong position here in the sledgehammer. You had the final question was which is critical, and that is yes. what would I do? What would I do? That's that's the final question is what and, would you do? And, and 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 what I would do is the last six months, the mm -hmm. Fed, by not looking at the money supply, the money supply has not grown, John. This is the hurting part. This is this is what's bothering you. How is the little guy going to get screwed eventually? He's going to get screwed again because the Fed isn't paying attention to the quantity theory of money. The money supply hasn't grown for six months. We're going to have one, one whopper of a recession as a result. And of course, the little guy is going to be the first guy to be thrown out of work when that happens. You don't have to do that. You, if they were watching the money supply and managing it properly, they'd be growing it what I would do about 5% and we would not have a whopper of recession. Right. We, 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 would, we would drag out the, the inflation, that excess money in the tub, remember, All right. would, would still come out eventually. It would take it a little longer to get out, but we wouldn't Let me ask you this then, because this is what I would do within this. Yes. Let's say we do manage the money supply better, but everything you said, was that the actions that the Fed, whether through money supply or interest rates take, we don't really feel the effects of for 12 to 18 months as it goes through the system. In that interim, is there anything to the idea of going sector to sector and having some corporate cooperation that can ease us into a smarter uh, monetary policy without having this deep culling of the economy and and is there a way for them to partner in this with government with people i mean the eu just did a a windfall profits tax i've heard consumption taxes you know is there anything that can happen that can help us along that 12 to 18 month period of getting this under control that can ease the pain because 2008 corporate america got away and people lost their homes and and I just I can't believe we're about to repeat something like that. Uh, well, again, the short answer is no. The government would screw the thing up. They they are screwing it up. And in Europe, by the way, the the government policies, whether mm -hmm. they be by individual countries or the or the European Commission, are, are destroying the economies in in Europe. What usually happens is if we go back to. Jerry Ford's uh, whip inflation now thing, what they call mm -hmm. an incomes policy where you have wage and price controls. They don't work. They, they create lots of distortions in the economy, shortages in the economy, black mm -hmm. markets in the economy. We've, we've gone through this with starting basically with in 1796, the French Revolution. That's what they did. You know what would happen to you, John, if you were French during the revolution, and yes, you I raised, I've, I've read and it. you raised, and you raised the price. You, 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 yeah, right. They'd shorten yeah, yeah. you. You'd, you'd be shortened a little bit. Yes. No. I think that's. I think that. Yeah. I think so, that's right. So, so all, all of these things are they're ideas that unfortunately are floating around in Washington D.C. and Brussels as well as as London, and and they they simply don't work. Well, Professor, remember the remember the remember the Beatles tune back in the USSR. Sure. That was a great tune. That was it. It's still a good tune. Oldie but goodie, I guess. Yeah. And and that's what the Soviet Union was doing. They 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 had this thing. Wage and price controls. Wage and price and and sector by sector. If we could have one sector cooperating with Moscow and the central planners, we could we could diddle all this, turn all the dials, and this comes back. This comes back to actually your noise thing. The economy is very complex mm -hmm. and it's it's all interconnected. And if you start screwing around one dial, believe me, you're going to have ripple effects all over the place that you never anticipate. And you're going to have all kinds of problems. And, and the, a lot of those problems are going to land on the back of the little guy. Right. Well, I, I, I very much appreciate it. Uh, that's the whole point, I guess, is, is that we're just going to use one big dial and the government, for the most part, interferes all the time in little way, you know, with subsidies and this and picks winners and losers. So it always I guess my point is it always feels like 
the government is interfering, whether it be the Fed or through subsidy policy or tax policy, in we don't really have a free market economy. They're they're making their picks of winners and losers all throughout. But then when it comes to us feeling the pain, they step out and just use the big dial. And I guess that's my I guess that's my concern. right, right. Well, the, your, your your point here, and this is a very critical one. We we mm -hmm. don't have a free market economy. We have an interventionist, what I call an that's interventionist right. economy, and it's it's being more intervened all the time, and that and that's and that and that's bad. Okay, look at us coming. We just came to a detente. At the very end, yeah. you and I okay. came full circle. May, I, 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 I'm just making a grade change. A, <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. This is, a, I'm in the 80s, baby. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for, for spending so much time with us. I, I truly do appreciate it. Uh, it it's, it's fascinating uh, to, to talk about these different theories. I have a feeling this podcast, the one we're doing, is going to create, I, I think there are going to be a lot of economists that are now going to be calling me and going, you have to put me on your program to rebut Hanky. I think this is going to end up being a, an ongoing discussion if you're if you're willing. Oh, I, I, I'm I'm willing. I, this is this has just been great, John. I'm just getting warmed up. I, I have oh, a lot. God. Of, I, How I long have, is your class? My I, God, I, Professor. Look at my notes. Oh wow! Look at oh, I don't have any you know, notes. That no, was the problem. I, no. I didn't bring any notes. I am positive. There's there's nothing that people love more than yelling at me about what I said wrong to you. So I'm sure there's some folks that are gonna come back out to talk about a different noise than you thought about. We'll come around and then we'll come back around to you. But that, so appreciate great. you taking the time and uh, your students are lucky to have you, sir. Thank you, John. Oh, we, but, we, 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 had a, I, we had a pretty good role. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.